Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, it's time once again for Music Night at the Majestic. And with us tonight, Frida Payne. Frida, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, it's great to have you here. You have had one of the most interesting careers of anybody I know. You have had a chance to work with some amazing people in so many different styles of music that goes way beyond the you know, big hit that uh, a lot of folks know you for with the Band of Gold. So I'm real interested in uh, speaking with you about some of these things. But as we often say on this show, every artist's journey starts somewhere. So for you, where did your musical journey begin? Well, it really started back in Detroit, which is where I'm from. Uh, I was born and reared there. And um, of course, I, uh, I also lived in New York when I was 18. I went to New York. And to seek my fame and fortune. And I lived there for, you know, about seven to eight years. Of course, I was always traveling as well, especially when I got jobs. And then when I got, and then when I signed with Invictus Records in 1968, going into 69, that's when I had to, uh, I was flying back to Detroit more often. And, uh, you know, when I was recording and working with them. But, my musical journey started when I was 13 and um, I just, I had entered some talent contest in Detroit. Uh, prior to that, I, I wasn't really singing, you know, like I wasn't recognized as a singer at all. Uh, and my piano teacher is the one who discovered that I had um, an, a voice that was exceptional as she said. And, uh, so after that, I uh, sang at the piano recital because I was taking piano lessons and so was my sister Sherry as well. And from one thing led to another and then I started winning, winning talent contests uh, locally and also on television. So people started to take notice and uh, even Barry Gordy Jr. at the time, I was, by this time I, would, I was 14, I believe, and he wanted to, you know, manage me and sign me up and all like that. This was prior Motown. There was no Motown and there was not quite Tamala records yet. So we're talking about the very beginning. And of course, we didn't, my mother wouldn't let me sign because uh, she figured that he was very re resistant in, in as far as uh, terms in a, in a contract. So she didn't like that. And we so sort of just moved on from that. Uh, but we're very close, very good friends to this day. So don't worry about that. Not to worry. <laughs> well, to, um, to, you, you mentioned talent contests. You are probably the only person who was on Ted Mack's Amateur Hour, the American Idol of its day. Right. And then also performed on American Idol. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. You're right. You're right. I, you know, I kind of like, I didn't put that together. Uh, yeah, I was 16 when I was on Ted Mac and that was in 1959. Whoa. And, uh, I didn't win first place. I won second place. I was up against a guy, an Italian tenor and this was his third win. So he already had all his relatives, you know, <laughs> voting for him, <laughs> you know, and some, so, uh, and then you're right. And then years, let's say decades later, decades later, I, I perform on American Idol as a professional and as a veteran uh, iconic uh, singer, as, as they say, disco R&B singer, although I'm really a jazz singer. <laughs> I'm really a jazz singer from the heart. Yeah, exactly. But that year, what was it 2008? I performed on American Idol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, amazing how things kind of, you know, uh, come around or, you know, what have yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, in, what a different, the- in a different form, you know, I wasn't competing. I was, but I was performing on a show that was considered a talent contest. Extraordinaire. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'll tell you, one of the people yeah, that uh, you uh, crossed paths with, Duke Ellington. Yes. How did that come about? Tell me, tell me about Duke. Okay. Well, I was 17 and back in Detroit. And um, we had a neighbor. He was an, a very prominent attorney in Detroit. His name was Alan Early Jr. He was a criminal attorney and he was very, became very good social friends with my parents. So he, he had heard me sing, you know, at different times, at different occasions. And um, he was at a cocktail party and he met Mercer Ellington. And uh, because Duke was in town with the big band and they were performing at a theater in Detroit. So he was telling Mercer about him and he said, oh, you have to hear this this teenager sing. She's really good. She's she's really exceptional. And so we got a Mercer to come to our house and I sang for him in our living room. And after I sang, he said, oh, he says, he says, you really have something. He says, I want my dad to hear you. And so they called Duke and Duke said, well, bring her down to the to the hotel. He was staying at the Gotham Hotel, which was a black owned hotel. Um, and he said, so my mother brought me down there and and Duke had a piano in his suite and he played for me. I did a couple of, I think I did, I got it bad and that ain't good. And maybe mood indigo, something like that. And he turned to me and he said, he says, you remind me of Lena Horn. And he said, I want to hear you sing with my band. The only problem is we're leaving in the morning to go to Pittsburgh. We pre- we're performing there for a couple of nights and, um, it may have been a week, but anyway, he said they were performing there at the Holiday House in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And if someone can drive you or bring you to, you know, to the Holiday House, I'd be more than happy to bring you up so that you can sing with the band. And that's what happened. It was my mother and a man named Mac Ferguson, who was my mentor at the time. He worked with me a lot, you know, learning, teaching me songs and technique and all that stuff. And we drove to uh, Pittsburgh and um, checked in at the Holiday House. And then that evening, Duke, like he had promised, he brought me up and I sang a couple of songs with the big band, with Duke Ellington's band. And, uh, And also that afternoon, I got to meet Billy Strayhorn because he was there with Duke. And um, it was, I didn't, I had heard of Billy Strayhorn, but I didn't know how important he was and uh, in, in, in so far as the history of music and jazz. And um, so I, I was happy about that. He was a sweet, a sweet man, a very nice man. And uh, that's, and then of course, after that, the band went on, their next engagement was in Las Vegas. So we drove, my mother and I and Mac, we drove back to Detroit. And then it was like about a week or two later, um, Duke invited invited me and my mother to come to Las Vegas because he was still interested. And he also offered me a 10 year contract to sing with the band. So we drove to Las Vegas and um, I got to, he brought me up again to sing with the band. But to make a long story short, when he uh, mailed the contract to to our home, to my home, uh, our attorney, who was Alan Early, who was our neighbor, really, and he read it, and my mother read it, and I, I think I read it too, and and they wanted to make some changes. The contract was for ten years, ten years. Now, my, mind you, I was just seventeen, so after wanting to make changes to the length of the contract make changes to certain things like what the salary pay scale would be. My mother said one thing. She said, Mr. Ellington, what if in about three or four years from now, 
you've made my daughter a star and she's and she can command uh, thousands of dollars four or five or six thousand dollars for an engagement would you adjust her her salary accordingly he said no so he wouldn't change any he didn't want to change he was like Barry Gordy he was he was like Barry Gordy he didn't want to change anything so <laughs> it that didn't happen <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> uh, well, honey, those are the story. That's showbiz. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, you also, if I recall correctly, uh, got to perform with Pearl Bailey. Yes. What was that like? I was 17. This happened all when I was 17. Um, I had just graduated from high school when I was 16. And I just turned 17. And ironically, the same, my same uh, Alan Early Jr., our neighbor and, and dear close friend to the family, he was at another cocktail party and he met a guy by the name of Bob Bailey. No relation to Bill Bailey, by the way. <laughs> you know that song, Won't You Come <laughs> Home, Bill Bailey? Won't you come home? But he met uh, Bob Bailey uh, at a cocktail party. And they got to talking and he started talking me up again. And it just turned out, Bob said, well, you know what? We had uh, one of our background sing singers just left and we're looking for a, a replacement for the background singers. And um, he said, maybe, maybe it might be, maybe she could come and audition. So I auditioned, I was the, everybody there were professional singers. And I was the only amateur because I'd never, you know, like, you know, been a professional before. I was still singing uh, as an amateur. And it was a double audition. It was an audition to be one of Pearl's background singers, as well as the second part of it was to dance. And the dancing was supposed to be, I was supposed to be part of a chorus line in Vegas at the Moulin Rouge. And that was a black owned casino uh, in Vegas on the west side. It was called um, the Moulin Rouge. I was hired, I got hired for both. Uh, the dancing part wasn't gonna take place till later on. And by the way, it never did, it never did materialize, but I was accepted as a dance because I had studied ballet and modern dancing. But the singing. They said, oh, yes, we like you. They wanted me. So like two days later, I was on the bus, <laughs> you know, with the Pearl Bailey Review. It was the Pearl Bailey Review. So that was my first professional job on the road, you know, and our first, um, the next city, we, the city we went to where I started was, was uh, Cincinnati. And then after that, it was New York, the Apollo. And then after that, it was the Regal Theater in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Tell me this, Frida. What's going through your mind when you're singing with Duke and then with Pearl? Well, with Duke, that was like a dream. It was nice, you know, because here I am. I would sang with, by the way, I'd sung, I'd sung with big bands before in Detroit, like the Jimmy Wilkins Orchestra. The Jimmy Wilkins Orchestra in Detroit at the time, and for years he was like the he was like the Count Basie of Detroit, and they were hired for like different affairs and uh, you know different galas in Detroit <clears throat> at the Latin Quarter or at downtown at Cobo Hall, and Jimmy would hire me. Uh, to come and and I would I would do like maybe two or three songs as the band singer, and I get paid like forty five bucks, and um, that would be it. So I had kind of like gotten I I had become accustomed to singing with a big band, and from the time I was fourteen until I was sixteen, three years, I was on a radio show called Don Large's Make Way for Youth, and it was on station WJR top of the Fisher building and it was it was it was NBC syndicated nationally 
and it came on every Saturday afternoon. And we had two days rehearsal and during the weekday, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And my mother, of course, would always drive me at, at yeah, because I wasn't really driving at that time. She would drive me, um, you know, to the Fisher Building in Detroit. And um, yeah, I was on that show for three years and it was a choral group <clears throat> and we sang everything, American Songbook, um, anything. I mean, National Anthem, the Canadian National Anthem, you know, the Hawaiian chant. Um, uh, we did, you know, spiritual, religious music. We did uh, the American Songbook, Cole Porter, Gershwin, uh, Rogers and Hart, you know, all those songs. And um, I was frequently uh, asked to do a solo by Don Large. And so it was me and the other girl that did solos was Ursula Walker. And at the time, Ursula Walker was like sort of like the pre premier singer because she was always on TV singing. And uh, I used to say, oh, I want to sing as good as Ursula Walker. So, <laughs> so um but she was the other one that uh, Don Large would give solos to. So it was between the two of us. Um, yeah. So that was my experience. So when I say got, so when I got to sing with Duke Ellington, that was like, oh, wow, this is the cream of the crop. Now I'm, I'm with the A team. <laughs> I'm with the A band. Cause the hey. guys in the band were legendary. They were legendary, you know? Absolutely. Well, Dave, you mentioned the Fisher building. That is a beautiful building. Oh, it still is to this yes. day. And we know, you and I both know, Detroit has changed a lot from the 60s. Yeah, the, 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 I'm an architecture buff. So, right. I mean, you know, the building gone... is still standing. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and all the, the stained glass and uh, say the architecture of the building to me is just oh. a treasure. And you know, there was a there was a there is a theater in the building. I right. mean a full size. It was originally a movie theater. And by the way, when it was a movie th theater, when I was a little girl, a young girl, I used to go there a lot. And it, it was beautiful. I mean, it was sort of like um the the architecture was was like Peruvian and they had like a little like a little pond downstairs and upstairs on the second floor it was just go i mean it was gorgeous they they redid it they renovated it and redid it to bring in regular stage shows and they kind of took away all that beautiful art yeah but the the, the painted ceilings just yeah. yeah just wonderful yeah yeah but the way it, when it was a movie theater it was even more beautiful in my yeah. opinion Unfortunately, I didn't get to go then. <laughs> it was all, only in the last, you know, 15 years I've been going to the Fisher Building or so. so but, right. uh, but hey, moving forward, we're going to jump up to 64, your first album, After the Lights Go Down Low and much, much more. Right. Now that on was, that, oh, go ahead. That was in New York. It was 1963. And I had one side was like, trio the other side was big band it was like a side big band b side trio mm -hmm. yeah now do that was on impulse that, that was on he? impulse impulse no, uh, the, the legendary which, jazz label right it was a legendary yeah john coltrane was on impulse even Absolutely. duke ellington was on impulse so i wasn't yeah. doing so bad <laughs> now duke uh wrote a song for for that album for you didn't he yeah I think what was the name of it? Blue piano. Blue piano, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I love it was it was a great experience. I know when I listen to it, I say, "Oh God, I was so uptight. I was so nervous." You know, I used you know how you critique yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What What's the one thing you remember most though about recording that record? Ah, uh, wow. I know it was. It was in this, it was sort of like at downtown in the 30s. And it was a studio that was uh, like a RCA, RCA studio, RCA Victor types, uh, RCA studio. And it was live. All the band members were there live, which is, they, we still do that to this day because the last, al the, uh, the album that I did, the last two albums I've done, 
ha has been with live musicians, like at Capitol, here in Hollywood, Capitol Records, Studio A, with a big band, you know, so I, I, I mean, we, they, it's still done to this day, but back then I was right there with the guys and, uh, you know, um, it was wonderful. I enjoyed it so much. Yeah. Bob Thiel was the A&R man. Yeah. I'll tell you, for, for the sake of time, I'm going to jump forward to Band of Gold. Mm -hmm. How did uh, that album come about? Well, Band of Gold was when I had signed with a label called Invictus in Detroit. Invictus was run by Holland Dozier and Holland. Eddie Holland was the president. And a guy named Otis Smith was the vice president. But of course, that uh, Holland Dozier and Holland, it was Lamont Dozier, Brian Holland, and Eddie Holland. They were brothers. And they were at Motown from its inception. From They were with Motown from the very beginning with Barry. They, are re they were responsible for the major hits of the Supremes, all the major hits of the Four Tops, uh, Martha Reeves, Marvelettes, Vandellas. Uh, they even wrote, Lamont Dozier, by the way, had written songs for almost everybody, even Marvin Gaye. And um, he is attributed to have written, uh, let's say 51, maybe 51 or 54 hit records, just him alone, and including Band of Gold as well. And then, of course, Brian and Eddie, they were involved in, in it, and they they also were involved in some of those, a lot of those songs as well. Uh, we recently lost Lamont Dozier, and I was at his memorial service at the Grammy Museum a week ago last Friday. And um, it was very sad, but, you know, he he had been ailing, and and we all miss him. Yeah, I went to school with Lamont. Did I you really? With Lamont. Yeah, we were we were actually uh, I think it was the seventh, the sixth, seventh, sixth and seventh and eighth grades. And uh, we were in the same homeroom. Uh, he he was he was singing then. But I mean, he was I didn't know if he was writing, but he was singing just beginning to write to be a writer. And because uh, I remember we were on the same amateur show at uh, Hutchins Junior High back in the at in the seventh grade. So, and that was when I was so nervous, you know, I was so very, by that time I was thinking I was 13. Yeah. I was just starting to sing and uh, come out of my shell. Cause see what, at, prior to that, I was a very shy person. I was very withdrawn and very shy. And uh, so I came singing kind of, and before people and being accepted brought me out of my shell. I'm still shy, but, and I'm kind of, and I'm very private, but um, that's part of my persona. That's that comes from childhood. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I'll tell you what was it like when you recorded "Band of Gold." When you were in the studio, did it did it hit you as, "Hey, I've got you know a hit here. I've got gold." No, not at all. Uh, actually, I thought the song was too adolescent for me. I thought that, oh, this, the lyrics, like, but that night on our honeymoon, we stayed in separate rooms. And I'm thinking, what the heck is that? <laughs> when I recorded Band of Gold, I was 28. And I'm saying, here, I'm a grown woman, you know. And uh, why would you have give me a song that seems like you, this would be a song meant for a 16 or 17-year-old singer to do? And they said, oh, don't worry about it, Frida. You know, it's a good song. Just sing it. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it came about. It was uh, given to me. This was the first album I did on Invictus. And it was given to me as one of the songs. Uh, to me, I thought everything, um, all the songs I did on that album were great. I thought any one of them could have been a, become a big hit. Yeah. Well, tell me this. Coming from that jazz background. Did you adapt your style or, you know, to do what is, you know, a different style of music for it? Or Absolutely. Did you, how did you approach it? 
Absolutely. I Because, listen, I'll give you an example. Nancy Wilson, who I loved, and she is one. Of, she was one of our iconic jazz vocalists up there with Ella and Sarah. It's to me Ella, Sarah, Nancy. I figured a Nancy Wilson would take a song, and you would know it was Nancy Wilson because she would put her jazz inflections into it. I decided I want a hit, and if I'm going to have a hit. I better follow the direction of how they want me to sing, not how I want to sing. And that's what I did. I'm, you know, I'm an actress, you know, so I was acting, you know, and um, Eddie Holland was in, and Lamont, basically they were in the control booth and, and uh, they would tell me how they wanted me to sing the song, uh, like even to the point of, okay, vibrato here or no vibrato there or cut that note off here and and um, don't don't give any, you know, don't jazz it up, just sing it straight out, you know, and that was it. So it really, the, the style really was more pop, but it was mm -hmm. also R&B. Right. So, so it, I it, did adjust, I did adjust my singing style. I, I adjust my style to what, what the song dictates. Well, and I think that's why so many singers are also good actors. Because mm -hmm. you're you're when you when you're singing, you're playing the role, if you will, of the lyric. Right, that's true. So, now, now for you, you also did acting, yeah, along the way. Yes. And just as you're probably the only one to be on Ted Mack and American Idol, you're probably the only person who worked with both Jerry Lewis and Eddie Murphy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I worked with Jerry Lewis. Uh, I was in his movie, one of the movies he made back in 1964 called Disorderly Orderly. And then I was in a movie with Eddie Murphy where I had a cameo role and it was called uh, Nutty Professor the Clumps. And that was, what's that? What was that? 2000? Was that 2000? Whatever year that was or. Yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah. 2000 or 1999, somewhere around. Yeah. There. Yeah. Now, what do you remember from either one of uh, filming either one of those movies? Well, the one in that was done here it was with the Jerry the Jerry Lewis movie called The Disorderly Orderly was done here in LA and it was done at the Doheny Estates and I remember having to get up so early in the morning and uh going to I, I'm trying to remember how yet we had to go a car picked me up and we had to go to uh the Paramount the Paramount Studios the lot on Melrose and here in Hollywood. And then from there, they would have a, we'd all get into a van, you know, the, you know, the, the extras and some of the actors, and then they would drive us uh, back into Hollywood and to the Doheny Estates. And that was like Beverly Hills. And that's where we did all the filming for that, for that movie, Disorderly Orderly at the Doheny Estates. And I played the role of a nurse and I just had, and they gave me one line. And because of that one line, I had to join SAG, Screen Actors Guild. And that's how I joined SAG back in 1964. And then um, now back to Eddie Murphy, fast forward a few decades. That was done at a restaurant here in Burbank, my scene. It was in a restaurant. And I was sitting at the bar and uh, that restaurant, matter of fact, I'm trying to think of the restaurant. What's the name of that? I can't remember the name of the restaurant, but it's the Smokehouse, I think that's called the Smokehouse. It's on uh, Olive, right? It's right across the, it was right across the street from, from Warner Brothers Studios. And it was, that was the location for that scene. And that was when Janet Jackson was the, also the headliner in the movie along with it, you know, Eddie Murphy and then co-starring Janet Jackson. And uh, Janet was there that, that day that uh, I had to do my scene. 
and she was there because I think she had something to do that day as well. And that was it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, uh, at the beginning, I said you yeah, mentioned about some of the people that you've had a chance to work with through the years. Mm-hmm. Your album from 74, Pain and Pleasure. Right. Two of the folks on that album, Ray Parker Jr. and Joe Sample. Played. Right. Right. Tell me about that record. Well, Pain and Pleasure, um, that was when I had my, that was the first album I did for ABC Records here in LA. That was an I, cause I had left Invictus by that time. And I, and then I got signed to uh, ABC records here in LA and Lamont Dozier is the one who basically, you know, got me the deal. Lamont and Otis Smith, Otis Smith had left Invictus and he was now working at ABC records and Lamont um, was going solo on his own for a while you know he still did stuff with with the guys but he kind of went on to he wanted to be more like of a solo artist on his own so he actually produced that album but mckinley jackson uh who was also involved with it got the credit for being the producer but in fact Lamont was the key producer and also he wrote some of the songs. Now he was involved in a legal a legal thing where he wasn't supposed to be producing until that legal suit was resolved. And that's the reason why he couldn't put his name as producer, but he produced that album, not McKinley Jackson. McKinley did work on it. He was right there as well. And McKinley Jackson is a Detroiter and uh, and uh, very close, you know, very close friends worked with Lamont a lot. And that was a oh. good album, by the way. That was a darn good album, Pain and Pleasure. That's why I bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> now, what was it like working with Lamont when you go from being 13 and, you know, you're in grade school together and now here you are all these years later, you know, in the studio together? You know, it's it's like uh, family. It's like family, and I I mean, my sister Sherry was very close with Lamont as well, and and we all worked together. Um, so it's sort of like he he was a part of my life. He just, you know, I I think Lamont always liked me in terms of, you know, appreciating my talent, and he was all in in a way he was always kind of looking out for me as well. And I think it probably had a lot to do with being a Detroiter and also the fact that we'd known each other so long. So um, that was what that was all about. Like, as they say, you know, blood is thicker than water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as you were talking about, about your music and your recordings mm-hmm. in the last couple of years, you've recorded several projects. You had the, uh, the duet with Johnny Mathis. Yes. How, how did that come about? Well, that was, oh my God, uh, a guy by the name of Rodrigo Rios, who is from Brazil. He's Brazilian, but he's really, his ethnicity is Italian. Uh, he's a drummer and uh, he was here in LA. Uh, he, he was working with Greg Fields. Uh, Greg Fields is also a drummer, a um, drummer with a wonderful, wonderful background as well. I think he used to work with Count Basie and uh, he's done a lot of great things, but Greg Fields was his mentor. And this uh, Rodrigo would come, would come to my shows. And, and then afterwards he would say, Frida, I want to work with you. You know, you should do, because I was, that was also when I was doing a lot of jazz. And he said, you're a really great jazz singer. He says, you should do, record um, um, a whole album of Ella. <clears throat> and so I, so it, it went from that to saying, you should do an album of duets. And he said, I can get Johnny Mathis. And, um, and then it went to Johnny Mathis. And then we got D.D. Bridgewater. 
And then he reached out to Kurt Elling and he got Kurt Elling. And, and then I, I said, well, what about Kenny Lattimore? And then I got Kenny Lattimore. And then I said, well, what, what, what do you, how are you going to do? He says, big band, it's got to be done with a big band and strings. So then we had um, a man who was really someone who's really close to me. His name is James Michael Getz. And Jane, Michael and I were very, very close, you know, as friends and sweethearts, actually. And Michael said, you know what? He says, I got this. I'm going to be the executive producer. So that's what happened. That's how that came about. So we recorded the whole thing at Capitol Records in Studio A. And uh, Michael was the executive producer and Rodrigo Rios was the line, we'll call it that he would be the line producer. Yeah. And and oh, and I and I was, I think I'm listed as the like a co-producer or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then we got Gordon Goodwin is uh did the arrangements. Gordon, he, excellent. Excellent arranger, Gordon Goodwin. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you mentioned Ella. Yes. You, you've been uh, performing as Ella for, for a few years now. Oh, yes. I, I started back in um, 2004. And even before that, I would I started doing a tribute to Ella, just a one woman thing with, you know, me and a trio. And then in 2004, uh, my friend, my dear friend who I also worked with, uh, Maurice Hines, Maurice Hines, his brother was Gregory Hines and uh, Maurice and I had worked together. We did the um, uh, the hit Broadway show Jelly's Last Jam where Maurice was playing Jelly, Jelly Roll Morton. And I was also I had a role in it and I was starring it, starring in it. And also uh, Savion, Savion Glover was the playing young, young Jelly as a tap dancer. And um, we did that tour for a whole year back in 1995. And so Maurice used to hear me warming up in my dressing room. And sometimes I'd be singing some jazz or, you know, scatting a little bit. And, and he said, you know what, Frida? He says, my brother and I used to open for Ella when she worked in Vegas at the Flamingo Hotel. And I got to know her. He says, but you sound just like Ella when you sing jazz. I said, do I? He says, has anybody ever told you that? I said, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. And so he called me up and he said, uh, region, there's a theater in New Brunswick, New Jersey. It's called Crossroads. And it's a regional theater. You know, that's an equity theater. And he said, they're, they're producing um, uh, the play, Ella Fitzgerald, First Lady of Song. The book is written by Lee Summers. And I'm calling you first to see if you would like to do the role of Ella. And I said, oh, yes, <laughs> I would love to do it. So I did it then, got rave reviews, got good reviews. And then 10 years later, he calls me again and he says, there's a theater in uh, Virginia. It's it's called, it, the theater's called Metro Stage. And... Um, it's in uh, Virginia, right? You know, because I could see the White House. I could see the Capitol building from my from my hotel suite. And uh, and he says that they, they want to produce. They want to bring, you know, the Ella Fitzgerald First Lady of Song. And and I did it there for like eight weeks, you know, performances. Another. And that's where I got a rave review from the Washington Post. And then. Uh, and then after 2014, was that 2004? And then in 2018, uh, once again, Maurice calls and says they want to do Ella. They want to, you know, put Ella on at the Delaware Theater in Wilmington, Delaware, which was another regional theater. And I did it once again, you know, three weeks there and, you know, good, good reviews, uh, and great acceptance, uh, matter of fact, uh, a great attendance and all that. You have a new memoir out. Yes, I Gold. have a new memoir. It's called Band of Gold, and here it is. 
and it's it's written by me and and Mark Bego. Mark Bego is a writer who's written several many books, like about sixty something books. <clears throat> and um, yeah, this came out uh, in twenty twenty one, and the uh, forward was done by Mary Wilson. Ah, oh, wow. I can't believe she's gone. As ironically, she had written the forward uh, two months before she passed away. Wow. And of course, nobody ever expected that to happen because there was no signs of anything wrong. But uh, as it turns out, there, there was a problem with her heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, Frida. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to make sure that we... Uh touch oh, on it here before we wrap this one up well and this is the cd with all my uh, duets johnny mathis <laughs> you know you can't take that away from me and um kenny Lattimore, let there be love the title of it is let there be love and then dd bridgewater and i we did two songs like a duet moaning and doodling and um and then kurt elling we did uh, Our Love is Here to Stay. Really nice, really good. I'm yeah. very happy with it. I'm very happy. How has the recording process changed from your first album to your most recent one? Well, technically, well, the um, I think things are things have changed in terms of the more this this more gimmicks <laughs> and stuff. But basically, when you do jazz, it's basically the same, you know, you, you don't use too many gimmicks in singing jazz. You use that when you're doing like rap or you're doing, uh, I would call, uh, you know, hip hop or Taylor Swift type stuff. You know, they use a lot of st like studio uh, technical stuff, you know, with the, uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm still old school. But they <laughs> use a lot of, and it sounds good. It sounds good. And also back then there weren't too many, there, we, we weren't into so many uh, uh, videos, you know, now you got to have a video, you know, like MTV, it started, it started out with MTV. Remember it was yep. MTV and it was videos and, and um, a lot of that, it helps though. I think doing videos does help. Right. Yes. It, it, it uh, you can reach a lot more people and sometimes that video will have an impact on somebody on selling in addition to the music. song itself. Yeah. On selling your music. Yes. And some videos, I mean, I was just watching some, uh, some of the latest stuff Taylor Swift is putting out. Oh my God. It's like, Oh wow. It's really nice. Very nicely and very well done. Yeah. Some, some of them are like little mini movies. Yeah. It, it, you're right. Like a mini movie. Yeah. yeah. And they spend a lot of money on them. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, Frida, throughout the show, we've had your website and your social media uh, scrolling across the screen so that people can find you and your music and your uh, memoir and all that good stuff. Yeah. So okay. I want to I want to thank you for taking the time to join us on the show. Well, thank you for having me. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. This has been Music Night at the Majestic with Michael Boswell. If you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content without the express written consent of Starliner Media is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time for Music Night at the Majestic. This is your announcer speaking.